Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Martell. I'm uh, similar to Steve. I'm a professional engineer here in Illinois uh, out of our Chicago office at CDM Smith. Um, Abby is joining me tonight. She's is, is, is also from our Chicago office. We do solid waste management planning and uh, studies and design work for uh, Illinois communities as well as throughout the Midwest. Uh, going to talk a little bit about ourselves first and uh, and then get into waste composition studies that we've done and kind of why they're important, what you use them for, uh, and then uh, again how the data can be used to to plan your future and then uh, and just talk a little bit in general about some other stuff. Uh, so I've been uh, working for CDM Smith for some time now. I have a, a bit of experience doing solid waste plans again in Illinois uh, probably most interesting one was for Glacier National Park. Uh, I got to sleep with the bears for a week as I learned about their waste disposal practices. But uh, I'm a past president of the Illinois chapter of SWANA, the Solid Waste Association of North America, and I'm now the current uh, international board director for the Illinois chapter of SWANA. Abby uh, joined our firm a, a little while ago, and she came from the city of Chicago uh, and helped. Uh, she oversaw the waste sort, one of the largest waste sorts in Illinois, well, the largest waste sort in Illinois, and uh, uh, she also was over there greenhouse gas uh, reduction programs. I, I should mention uh, my personal uh, uh, information is that I'm a resident, a proud resident of Lincolnwood, which is obviously a swank community. I wish Tim was here to see me tonight. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I'm very pleased actually as a resident with the service that we receive. Uh, so CDM Smith brings a variety of services. Uh, we're a 6,000 person firm. We're a full service consulting engineering firm dealing in transportation, energy, water, the environment, and solid waste being part of that. Uh, we do, again, solid waste plans. We do waste composition studies, work at landfills. Uh, we do a lot of work for the public sector, I'll say, probably about 80 to 90 percent. 80% nationally, closer to 95% probably locally of our work is for the public sector, municipalities, states, and, and so forth, uh, doing whatever services they need. Uh, so most of our landfill work here in Illinois is uh, closures and things like that, compliance audits. Actually, we did the, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, you guys switched over to uh, Winnebago recently for your disposal, Winnebago Reclamation, and uh, we did the compliance audit for that. Um, we do other permitting and so forth of compost and transfer stations as well. So. so why is it important to understand what's in your waste stream? Well, it's, it's really the basis, it's the first step really in, uh, in doing a solid waste management plan or a plan update or, a, or an implementation plan uh, for whatever direction you're deciding to go, whether it be to increase recycling, decide whether you want to use a transfer station, direct haul to a landfill or, or whatever it may be. It's important to understand how much waste is being generated by your communities, what the composition is, uh, what's being recycled and so forth. So you, you first do that and based on that, you can do your evaluations of the capacity of your system, your existing system, uh, make your decisions as to where you want to go with re recycling rates or, or whatever that may be. And then you can evaluate the capacity of your system to handle your desires. Um, so, and once obviously you have that, you can develop an implementation plan and, and how you're going to go there. So to get a little bit deeper into the solid waste characterization side of things, um, we did the statewide, CDM Smith uh, not only did the city of Chicago uh, waste composition study, but we also did a, a, a statewide study for the Illinois Recycling Association. Uh, for the state study, I'm going to use this as an example just because it was uh, more uh, broad, I guess. Uh, we looked at, uh, we did sampling at 19 different disposal locations, transfer stations and landfills. And, uh, and I'll show you a photo of what exactly it looks like to do these types of, this type of work. Um, so we looked at different urban and rural areas, characterized uh, the different waste streams uh, and uh, whether it be residential, institutional, industrial, and uh, commercial waste, as well as C and D, construction demolition debris. So we did quite a few samples and uh, in order to get statistically significant information, not just 
statewide, which would have only required about 40 or 50 samples, but also within each of the different regions of the, uh, of the state. So waste, when we talk about waste, I think some people use the terms quite loosely, uh, whether you're a professional or not. Uh, there's, there's solid waste, there's municipal solid waste, there's uh, just waste in general. Uh, the different streams, this, this figure shows this, the streams that were studied by this study, which obviously the easiest thing to study is the material that's being landfilled. Uh, as, as your folks know, it's often difficult to quantify what's being recycled because not only it's not as simple as just going to the local recycling facility, which there's never just one, but oftentimes even if you find the right facilities, that facility takes their material to another facility and you could be double counting or missing something or they take a, to a facility outside your study area. Uh, there's waste reduction activities that are often you know, nearly impossible to quantify uh, without just uh, qualitative data. So this, we really focused on the landfill material and tried to identify what was diverted, recovered, uh, uh, is the term used on the slide, uh, diverted from the waste stream by looking at what was generated and what was landfilled. The C and D sector, we did looked at look, we did look at what the landfill C and D is. CCDD all the way at the bottom of the chart here, a clean construction and demolition debris is actually by Illinois regulation, or Illinois Act uh, definition, not technically a waste, but it does include soils and concrete, uh, so it it does, you know, it consists of materials that could be considered waste if it was taken to a landfill. And uh, again, the other category is special waste and just other things that weren't landfilled. So this is a, uh, a photo of what a, a physical sort looks like. Uh, you physically go through the materials. Uh, you take 200 to 300 pound samples of certain samples uh, collected by, uh, uh, by our folks. As trucks are coming in, we, we know which areas of the county or, or the service area that we're trying to collect from. We take those samples, we uh, have a, a, an end loader grab a sample, and that's what's located on those tarps on the, on the left-hand side. And then our team, we have two tables here set up, takes each sample over to the table and slowly sifts through them and divides them into the different buckets. In this category, there's 79 different categories. That is a very large number of categories, uh, but the state wanted a very specific definition. So there's quite a bit of good data from the study. So this is what we call physical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I have a soft spot, not to get off topic, but my wife is a geologist. She used to work at CDM 15, 20 years ago. And uh, we, I took her out. She was doing other types of work, brought her out to Kansas to do a waste sort with me, and uh, we fell in love over the waste sort table. So. I, I thoroughly enjoy waste sorts. I've done uh, about 20 different sorts and 50 different season samples and tons, tens of tons of uh, material uh, physically sorted. And uh, so anyway, that's the what's called physical sorting, where you actually dig through the materials. This next uh, photos are uh, of C and D materials in particular. Obviously, trying to get a 250 pound sample of what's shown on the figure here, concrete and demo wood and things like that would be difficult to sort through if not impossible. Uh, so we do it visually. We look at the load. Oftentimes, again, it's mostly concrete, mostly wood. We come up with volume percentage uh, breakdowns and then use densities that of using data that we have uh, developed in the past to convert uh, that material to uh, or those volume percentages to a, a weight percentage. So quickly, I'll, I'll thumb through some of the uh, categories. I think they're, you'll be surprised. I mean, they're, I, they should obviously be familiar to you. The paper consisted of these individual categories, uh, not bolded. So there's an overall uh, a, a category called paper or a group called paper. And then we had individual categories that we sorted out. So newsprint from the white office paper, magazines, OCC uh, cardboard, and craft paper, box board, various materials there, and there, there's some photos. Uh, beverage containers, so this would be uh, aseptic coated beverage containers, like your uh, orange juice. Uh, plastics, uh, a variety of different categories here. A lot of folks like to know not just 
the one and two anymore. They want to know one through seven, what the breakdown is. And uh, in number two, HDPE, you know, on the photo here in the middle, there's HDP natural or clear, which is the uh, milk containers, your one gallon milk containers. Uh, your laundry soap is a number two HDP colored. So it's, a, it's you can't see through it. So they're both HDPE, but one is clear or natural and one is colored. And uh, the question before about film, film is usually um, about definitely less than 2%, typically around 1% of the waste stream that's being landfilled. Uh, glass, glass bottles and so forth, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Aluminum cans, you'll see later the, uh, the value of aluminum and aluminum cans is uh, the highest of all recyclables uh, uh, typically collected. Uh, ferrous containers, uh, somewhat valuable as well. Uh, the organic section, this includes yard waste, and we broke this down into compostable, which is the smaller pieces of uh, grass and so forth, versus the uh, woodier ones that wouldn't be easily compostable. And then obviously there's uh, diapers and food and things like that. So we have values for each of those. C and D, again, this is a, actually a very large percentage of the waste stream. We look at what C and D is landfilled in the residential stream and commercial streams, but also just direct hauls of C and D, again, for demos and uh, uh, roof jobs and, and things like that. In organics, this is where we put the HHW, uh, fluorescent lights, and so forth. And, and I didn't bring the entire report, so I don't have the number. I can get back to you with what the fluorescent bulb exact value was for our study. So uh, textiles. So this, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the categories, but the, uh, the next few charts show the results of the study. Um, the pie chart shows those top level categories, organics and paper and plastic, obviously comprising the, the largest percentage of the waste stream. And again, this is residential pretty similar for the various waste streams. But the, uh, if you look at the left-hand side, food scraps, cardboard, newspaper, compostable paper. So the compostable paper would be like uh, toilet paper, uh, tissue paper, paper towels, et cetera. Um, those top 10 categories there are individual categories. And those 10 individual categories out of the 79 comprise pretty much half the entire waste stream. So uh, that, that really shows you the, the top components to be chasing, at least from the residential side of things. The uh, same thing uh, on the ICI, and again, uh, ICI, residential, I think you're used to seeing, ICI is uh, industrial, institutional, and uh, commercial. So commercial being the retail and so forth, uh, institutional, governmental, and, and uh, uh, schools and such, and then industrial, pretty self-explanatory. So those three categories we often lump together and uh, so again, you're seeing organics, paper, and plastic being the uh, highest percentages here. The individual categories vary quite a bit. The, uh, the residential numbers I'll, I'll, I'll mention are pretty uniform generally, depending on where you are. Obviously in the state, even in the country, we've done waste sorts across the country. Uh, things change. We have done some studies at, in Salina, Kansas. For whatever reason, they had us come back 10 years later and we saw the percentage of plastics go up and we saw the impact on their them implementing a compost program and, and the yard waste being diverted. But generally it's 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 pretty consistent data. The ICI information, the commercial industrial waste streams, really depend on the location. It depends whether or not you have uh, a, a Tony's Pizza Factory or, a, or whatever it may be in your communities and that could heavily influence the data then. Uh, this is the composition of the C&D materials. Obviously, a lot of shingles, concrete, wood, and such, as would be expected. And so here's the uh, total compositions of the uh, entire landfill waste stream. And so, again, this is, uh, th this is one thing to look at. It seems like uh, your facility handles mostly residential waste, so you might want to continue to focus just on the residential waste stream. If you're uh, interested in doing other programs, obviously, uh, the work with the schools and a lot of these e-waste programs and, and the one-day events that the, your staff leads uh, helps get some of the other uh, waste streams as well. I, uh, that was the statewide data. I did pull out the results. As I mentioned, we looked not only at the, the region level and statewide level, but we actually also looked at the county level in our report for the Illinois Recycling Association. And so this is the data I pulled off for uh, Cook County 
again, I, I think the study, this data is from 2008, I believe, uh, or estimates are for 2008. So Cook County in, in, tire, in its entirety, including the city of Chicago, generates uh, almost 8 million tons of waste. Uh, Steve passed on some information and you handle about uh, a little over 300,000 tons of just residential waste. And uh, I didn't have the time to estimate what I thought was in, in your other waste streams. Um, but this is what's generated, uh, the millions of tons generated statewide. Obviously, you see, you'll see a large concentration of waste being generated in the uh, metropolitan area, Chicago metropolitan area. The generation estimates were based on information from our landfill data that we collected and the Illinois, uh, the state of Illinois IPA uh, reports that are generated. But also, even more so, we used a sales-based approach, which means that uh, Franklin and Associates was our subcontractor. Uh, they're actually the folks that develop for the last 30 years, probably, the US EPA estimates. And so as opposed to going out and doing surveys and collecting data uh, by hand, they look at the number of magazines sold annually. They look at the number of aluminum cans sold and, and things like that to look at, you know, number of newspaper subscriptions. So on a county by county data as, as that's available or, uh, or regional data or state data. So we came up with a statewide estimate of how much waste is being generated by county using that. We felt that was probably the more accurate way of estimating the generation because, um, Again, we were trying to really come up with what was being diverted, and uh, the, we could either come up with what was being diverted or we could came up, come up with what was being generated, and we felt we could more accurately come up with what was being generated. So we landfill numbers, very reliable, the generated numbers, uh, the best they could be based on the sales-based approach, and that's how we de uh, developed our diversion numbers. Um, we looked at some individual diversion rates, but I think what's more interesting is that uh, these results that uh, we found that overall the state of Illinois is diverting about 19.1% of the waste stream. The, uh, the third column there shows the, uh, the diversion rates reported in the IEPA capacity report for each of the different regions. And our study had uh, considerably lower numbers. I don't think this is a matter of just false reporting or anything negative. It's, uh, it's really just a matter of the fact that Illinois does not have standard categories for what should be included. Some people count C and D, some people don't. That's obviously a very heavy component of the waste stream. So if you include that, you're getting some results. It's just a matter of, some people include grease, some people don't, our study didn't include that. So, so it's just a matter of uh, consistency in reporting uh, more than anything else, but uh, it was still just an interesting comparison to do. So I'm gonna pass the presentation over to Abby to talk about an example uh, with the city of Chicago. Uh, so after and while they were actually doing the statewide uh, waste characterization study, they also, we piggybacked on that and we did the citywide waste characterization study. And the results um, showed that the city of Chicago generates on average about 7 million tons of waste per year. And uh, one thing that's important for understanding the Chicago waste stream is how it's collected. And this pie chart shows that um, the three main sectors the privately collected, which is the industrial, commercial, institutional, and the multi-unit residential. And then there's the Department of Streets and Sanitation collected residential, and that's important because that's the material that the city has direct control over. Uh, that's your low density residential, four units and less. And then there's the construction and demolition debris sector, which you can see is a large portion of the waste stream. So the portion that the city actually has control over is only 15%. Um, we do have, or the city does have ordinances that cover the other sectors, but it's just an important thing to note for planning purposes. And then looking at the privately collected and the Department of Street and Sanitation collected waste together, it's very similar to the statewide, it's very similar to the US EPA, shows that paper and organics comprise the majority of our waste stream. There's some C and D in there, uh, plastic and textiles bringing up the rear. Um, we also looked at, after the waste characterization study, the maximum and current diversion rates that would be achievable. So we wanted to see, okay, where are we now? What's our percent recycling for each of these different type of materials? But then what could we reasonably expect to achieve? Um, and we looked at that rate by comparing rates that are happening in other high performing areas like Seattle or San Francisco to see given current technologies, nothing new or fancy, 
uh, what would be a reasonable maximum achievable rate for the city of Chicago. And you'll see the two columns, there's the current Chicago rate, and then there's the estimated citywide curbside rate. And that reflects the fact that at the time of the study and still now, um, the streets and sand only had blue cart recycling at about a third of the households. Um, so we extrapolated that to, okay, once we have recycling citywide for all of the low density households, what would that rate be like and compared that to our maximum achievable rate. So in some instances, we were, looks like we were doing better and in other instances, we had a long way to go. Um, for like plastics especially, we were pretty low. Um, and then this is the same thing, but for the privately collected sector, comparing our current rates to the maximum achievable. Again, showing a newspaper, we weren't doing so well compared to what we think we could be able to get to, but other items like paper, high grade paper, we were actually doing pretty well. And then this is taking the same data and just plotting it to see um, percentage of waste stream wise. We found that for construction and demolition debris, we're actually, our current diversion rate of 65% is pretty close to the maximum rate. Uh, however, the streets and sand collected and the privately collected, there's a large, long way to go. So in general, for planning purposes, we thought, okay, construction and demolition debris, it's doing pretty well. We're almost to our maximum. We really need to concentrate on the privately collected and um, city collected waste streams. And so using that information, what I think is more interesting, you have your waste study results. They're all great, but how do you apply it and how do you then move forward and actually implement programs related to it? There's many different ways you can plot the data and look at it to help prioritize. This is just one example. This was actually done before the waste study, but I'll compare it to one uh, in a second that is, use, is using the results of the waste study and it comes up with very similar conclusions where you can prioritize not only by how much is generated, but also what you're currently recycling so that um, if you're not generating a lot, but you're recycling a lot, you know, taking all those factors into consideration to determine which materials you should really focus your time and effort on since resources are limited. Uh, so this is another way to take a look at it. What we did here was we looked at uh, the total tons of material that's being landfilled and then the total tons that we thought would be available for capture based on that maximum diversion rate and identified which materials are really out there to, um, that we can really capture and we think that we could uh, try to get through recycling programs or uh, educational outreach. And again, time after time, paper and food scraps uh, kept on coming up. No matter how you looked at the data, those always seemed to be the two materials that we should go after. Um, and then the waste audit we also were doing under the Climate Action Plan. So we looked at the significance of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, just another way to prioritize. But again, paper uh, came out ahead. And so as a result of that, um, and during that time, we implemented a lot of different programs, several related specifically to paper. Uh, we already had the construction demolition debris recycling ordinance. That's why we're already doing so well. Uh, but a direct result of the audit, we implemented some neighborhood paper drives. We did it two years in a row where we partnered with some different waste firms and had communities, organizations uh, take part and do two weeks of collection and it was a competition. We had over 60,000 pounds of paper collected in just two weeks. So these are just some examples of programs that were developed specifically based on uh, the results from the waste audit. So, so th those are some examples, uh, again, going back to the big picture, um, when you have this, types of these, this type of data and you look at the individual recycling rates, you need to go back and look at whether it's being whether a low recycling rate is potentially being caused by not having adequate facilities. Uh, you know, since the city of Chicago passed that C and D recycling ordinance mandating basically you can't get a permit unless you do your recycling, and if you don't do your recycling, you're not going to be able to get your next permit. And apparently, Cook County uh, just recently passed a similar law. Uh, the the development of C and D processing facilities was sparked and now there's multiple facilities that handle CMD materials in the city of Chicago and in the metropolitan area. So, so change occurs sometimes by regulation. Um, I, obviously when you're doing planning, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but obviously when you're doing planning, you wanna look at where the waste is being generated. You don't wanna uh, establish facilities or programs uh, and the lower density areas uh, from a cost perspective. Um, uh, sort of similar to what was being discussed earlier, this pie, uh, well, I don't even know what you want to call it, scatter plot chart uh, on the left hand side. Uh, this was actually something we did for the Solid Waste Agency of Lake County uh, quite a few years ago 
it was a transfer station feasibility study, but uh, you, you mentioned earlier about comparing your prices to other transfer stations, and this was one method that we looked at to find out, uh, knowing their existing disposal rates, their existing landfill disposal rates, and to decide whether or not to move forward with the transfer station, we looked at uh, landfill disposal rates throughout uh, Illinois or northern Illinois and, and plotted it based on uh, hauling costs. So the further the landfill was away, we were able to account for those additional costs per mile and uh, develop landfills that uh, could serve as uh, potentially cost effective versus not. So not exactly what you were talking about, but it's, it's, it's a way of doing analysis to, uh, to, to look at those types of things. Um, I think one of the more interesting things to you, and I wish I gave more time for this, is the uh, historic commodity values. Um, that top green line is the uh, is the aluminum price, and and you'll see it's uh, you know close to 2,000. This is uh, this is a little bit dated data now. The, you probably can't read it, but this starts in January 2001 and goes up to July of 2011. You'll see in October, November 2008 was right after the Olympics in, in Beijing. And uh, they had, basically they were trying to deal with their smog problems and, and this, this big drop in value occurred because they were holding a lot of materials outside the border basically. And, uh, and when the Olympics ended and you know, it had just too many things going against it, that, you know, them who take the most amount of these materials, the recession and so forth, it just compounded and the markets just completely dropped due to that surplus of material and, and so forth. So, uh, so that's the reason for that big drop. As you folks have noticed through your own rates uh, in, in contracts, the, obviously the rates have come back up somewhat and, and recovered, but uh, you'll see the uh, plastics are, are more at the bottom. That red line that's pretty much flat across there is glass and uh, the, the, the papers generally show it trading at $25 a ton. Uh, usually it's, you're lucky to get zero, so. Um, Here's the paper rates, and, uh, and I, my understanding is your uh, uh, your fees are based on OMP or yeah mixed paper, I think. Number uh, eight. What was that? Number eight. Number eight news. Okay, so that would be uh, the blue line there. Uh, so again, you'll see ups and downs. There's a lot of different ways to establish those rates, and 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 you actually mentioned that the the processing fee you felt was a little bit high. It's I think it's around 70 right now. Um, I'll say that when we were negotiating the city of Chicago's rates with uh, resource management a few years ago, it was closer to 50. I think really though, it's, it's kind of a, it's, you're gonna get whatever you're gonna get in a way. Like we, we developed a formula so that people could bid. We established um, you know, one formula and basically they had to give two different numbers uh, in order to, on their bid so they could determine what the, the, the value was that was gonna be paid for the next three months. Uh, whether you tie it to OMP or, uh, or, or something else, they're, they're gonna get what they're gonna get. Uh, it's, it's really about the, how you package their risk and things like that. So if you guarantee minimums with the city of Chicago, we guaranteed a minimum of zero, which was actually, again, very beneficial during the market drop, but uh, because at least they weren't being paid because most folks would have been uh, charged. Um, but uh, it, it really just depends on how you set things up. So just in closing, uh, I, I think understanding the composition of waste is very important. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go and do your own swank study for your member communities. I think there's a lot of different information there. If you were trying to do something very targeted to a specific waste stream or something like that or a specific area, you might want to uh, invest a little money in that. But, but, but honestly, it's really just about reorganizing data that's pretty much already available uh, one note I did want to make is that there were some handouts for US EPA data today and, and, and there's the Chicago study data and then we have state of Illinois data that we've done. And you can't really just mix and match. You really need to understand the nuances of how the waste sort was conducted in order to understand how to, how to mix and match the data. Uh, so that's really where I would invest time because it's pennies on the dollar compared to going out and doing waste sorts. Um, but uh, just how you move forward, obviously you want to look at where you want to be with your diversion rates. You want to look at the value of, of the materials and, and decide how you want to move forward based on that. You obviously need to consider the maximum achievable diversion rates. You might be near the maximums at some materials, just like the city of Chicago was. 
you want to look at whether or not you think sustainability and greenhouse gas reduction goals are are more important or or just flat economics i mean it's really up to you how you move forward and it but it's just a matter of having good data to, to be able to make those educated decisions so i'll leave it at that so at least we have a few minutes for questions